Amen. Amen. Well, have you ever been in a hopeless situation? A hopeless situation, maybe a hopeless season, a season of life where it just seems like nothing's going your way. Maybe it's a crazy circumstance, it's a divorce, it's a, it's a disease, a diagnosis, something's happened. Maybe you made a dumb decision. Whatever the case is, for whatever reason, you're just feeling right now hopeless. I was thinking about the word hope, and this phrase kept on coming back to me. I think hope is like oxygen to the human soul. We're pre-programmed to have hope deep in our soul. And when we have no hope, it's like we are suffocating. It's like we're dying on the inside. It reminds me, recently I was in Fort Lauderdale working out at this, this studio, and they would put up the, the <laughs> degrees to over 100, and then you would go through this workout. And I was like in the middle of the workout going, I don't know if I'm going to make it. I'm, I'm suffocating. I'm, I needed to go like open the door and get some fresh air. You ever been there? Huh? I feel like that's where some people are at today. Just, just suffocating because there's no hope. And I was thinking about different kinds of hope. I was thinking about just the simple hope for the future. What are you looking forward to in this season? Isn't it a wild thing, like when you're a kid, you're like looking forward to so much. And sometimes, if we're not careful, you get older and then it's like the same old, same old, and you, and you start losing hope. This might sound silly, but I just want to be authentic with you. I, one of my greatest joys in life was raising our kids, amazing boys. And I know the goal is always to shoot them out like arrows and have them like send it in life. But if I'm honest with you, I, I've been grieving the last few years as they've left the house. And I know it's a minor problem and y'all are looking at me like, oh, preacher, you got no, you, come on now. But there was something in me that's kind of like dying on the inside until... I started like prayer, prayer walking, and now you know what I'm looking forward to? Grandkids. <laughs> Hi, we're my grandparents. Raise your hand. Y'all have hope again, don't you? Hope again, hope for the future. I was thinking about hope for a second chance. If you and I don't have a hope for a second chance, we're, we're in for it as humans, because we blow it. How many have blown it in your life? Blown it bad. Maybe someone has done something to you, taken advantage of you, abused you, and now you're stuck in this place of hopelessness, dying on the inside. I came to bring good news. There is hope in Jesus. No matter what you're walking through, he can give you hope again. You can come alive again. Too many of us, when we lack hope, we self-medicate to get away from all the pain. We, we over-entertain ourselves. We're scrolling all day long. We're numb. We're trying to numb the deep pain of lack of hope. The, and the number one form of hope that we all need is the hope of heaven. I just said goodbye to my father-in-law recently, and as we said goodbye to him, his last few breaths, as painful as it was, it actually was powerful because I saw the day that he said yes to Jesus in his eyes, and I remembered that time. Because of what Christ has accomplished, not what he did. Billy was a knucklehead, just like me. But, but because what Christ did, his perfect life and his blood that was shed, I was sitting at his bedside celebrating that one day I'm gonna step into eternity and be rolling with Billy again. It's the hope of heaven. Do you have the hope? If not, good news, today you can walk away different. You can, it doesn't matter what's happening in your life, it doesn't matter how bad you've blown it, I have good news, you can walk away different, filled with hope. Someone say hope. And I'll tell you how, if you're a note taker, number one, let's talk about the crucifixion. The hope for heaven starts and ends with Jesus and what he did on the cross. It's the crucifixion, and so let's, let's read about it, and to set up the story, remember, and you guys read it this week, 
Those of you that have been part of Love Church and you're in the weekly reading, it's so cool how the, it lined up perfectly to read about the crucifixion and resurrection of Christ. Wasn't that amazing, by the way? And so you read about it. And the context is this, these, these Jewish leaders were threatened by Jesus and what was happening. They falsely accused him. This guy Judas, who is one of his disciples, betrays him with a kiss, and they bring him to the Romans, this guy Pilate, and Pilate knew. Pilate's like, this guy, this guy's not a bad dude. Tried to release him to the Jews. Instead, they call for Barabbas, and now he's on his way to be crucified for your sin and my sin. Check this out. Verse 26 says, so Pilate released Barabbas to them. He ordered Jesus flogged with a lead-tipped whip, then turned him over to the Roman soldiers to be crucified. There it is, right there. Now, this is what tripped me out. If you continue to read in verse 27, some of the governor's soldiers took Jesus into their headquarters and called out the entire regiment, like, come on, boys, let's go. Let's attack this guy. Look what they did to him. Your savior, my savior, in verse 28. They stripped him. How humiliating. They stripped him put a scarlet robe on him. They wove thorn branches into a crown and stuck it on his head. They placed a reed stick in his right hand as a scepter, mocking him. Then they knelt before him in mockery and taunted, Hail, King of the Jews. Verse 30, and then they spit on him. Can you imagine? This is the king of the world and they're spitting on him. They grabbed the stick and they struck him on the head with it when they were finally tired of mocking him they took off the robe and put on his own clothes on him again. Then they led him away to be crucified. I don't know about you, but when I was reading that, that's hard to take in. How many have seen The Passion of the Christ? Raise your hand in here. If you haven't seen the movie, you wanna learn more about this text, how he was flogged, flagellation was brutal, it was a leather whip with chunks of bone and glass and metal in it. And they would tie the, the person, their hands around this wooden stick and they would whip their back. And these, these pieces of bone and metal and glass would lodge into the back and then they would rip it off and there would be ribbons of flesh that would come off the back. And why is this so graphic and why did this happen? Because that's how God feels about sin because it hurts his kids. God doesn't wink at sin. He actually has to punish it because he's a holy and just God and it breaks his heart. But the beauty of the gospel is God loved us so much. He's like, I don't want my kids to have to go through that. I don't want Chris to have to go through that. So guess what? I'll go through it on their behalf. My perfect life beaten and whipped so that they can be set free. It's so wild, when I, was, when I was studying this, it was wild. I was looking at this, this crimson robe they put on him. That's a picture of your sin and my sin. They put on Jesus. And now, guess what? What do we get? We get his robe of righteousness, perfect and holy. So one day when I step into eternity and, and God's like, why should I let you in? I'm like, you shouldn't. But because of what Jesus did in that perfect robe, now he's gonna see me as perfect. He's, gonna, he's like, yo, enter in. Enter in, not because of what you did, but because what I did for you. It was this beautiful exchange. And it was predicted and prophesied hundreds of years before by Isaiah. I wanna show it to you in Isaiah chapter 53. Listen to this, this is powerful. It says he was pierced, Jesus. This is predicting years in advance. I love how God does that to solidify our faith. This is not a pipe dream. This is truth that we can live by. He was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. All of us, all of us. It doesn't matter who you are here today, all of us. You might be Mrs. Goody Two Shoes or you could be Hitler. All of us, we, all of us have have strayed away like sheep. Bah, we have left God's past to follow our own, yet the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. They stripped him. They spat on him. They mocked him. It was our sin that he was paying for. 
The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, 21, this is good news now, he made him, Jesus, who knew no sin, perfect life, to be sin for us. Why? That we might become the righteousness of God in him. Someone say amen right about now. That is, that is really, really good news. They were mocking him. They were like, hey, if you're really Jesus, save yourself, hop down off that cross. He stayed on. Because he knew if he did, then you'd have to pay for your own sin. He's like, no, I love my people too much. I'm gonna stay put right where he needed to be. One of the most powerful statements he said on the cross too, as they were mocking him, you know what he said? He said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. What a powerful statement. If I'm God, I'd be like, man, I took enough of this. He zapped those folks. Aren't anybody grateful for a God of grace and mercy? And he's like, they don't know what they're doing. By the way, just real quickly, those of you that have friends and family members that aren't quite connected to God yet, can we stop zapping and actually praying for them? Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And it's only by God's grace that your eyes were opened in the first place. So who are we to be able to condemn? There's no room for that in the Christian faith. So good. So at noon, verse 45, darkness fell across the whole land until three o'clock. At about three o'clock, Jesus called out with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lema sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? It was a powerful statement. We were discussing it at our small group because therefore those few hours as he took our sin upon him, God the Father who's perfect could not have connection with him. So there was a separation. He's like, why have you abandoned me? God can't have anything to do with sin. Then verse 50, Jesus shouted again. He released his spirit. By the way, no one took that life from him. He gave it away. He released his spirit. At that moment, the curtain in the sanctuary of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. That's powerful. In the Old Testament, the way they approached God in the temple is one time a year, only the high priest could approach God. And he had to come in with a perfect lamb whose blood was shed one time. And he'd enter into the Holy of Holies that area was separated by this thick curtain. So when Jesus paid the price for our sin, he was the lamb that was slain with the perfect blood. And now the, the veil was torn from top to bottom. It was like God was just ripping that thing as Christ's body was ripped. Now that, that separation between God and man was fully dealt with. And now you and I have access to God. We don't have to be the high priest. It doesn't have to be on Yom Kippur. It can be every day, every moment, we have access to the presence of God. That's good news. That is Easter power, word of God news. And Jesus, the last words he said on the cross was to tell us die, which means it is finished. It's done. Religion many times is do, 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 try to earn God's favor. Jesus said it is done. It's finished. It's done. It's the crucifixion. And number two, quickly, we're just going to touch on this, but this is powerful, the burial. The burial. So Christ breathes his last. He gives up his spirit. In verse 57, as evening approached, Joseph, a rich man from Arimathea who had become a follower of Jesus, he goes to Pilate, he asks for Jesus' body. And Pilate issued an order to release it to him. Joseph took the body, wrapped it in a long sheet of clean linen cloth. Clean linen cloth. Verse 60, he placed it in his own tomb, which had been carved out of the rock. Then he rolled a great stone across the entrance and left. So just for a moment, put yourself in the disciples' shoes, in their sandals. They had seen Rome as the threat, Jesus as the one to come, save them from tyranny, bondage. 
They're following him for three years. They just gave up everything and followed him. Now all of a sudden, their king is crucified. He's buried. And now there's sadness and silence and talk about lack of hope. Have you been there? The, 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 there was two disciples that were on the road to Emmaus and there was sadness on their face. Jesus actually rolled up on the side of them, which I would love to just be there. Wouldn't that be amazing? And they start walking and the Bible actually says they had hoped that Jesus would come and save them. They had hoped, but now they had kind of given up, hopeless. And I believe that's someone in here today. You're, you're stuck in Saturday. The crucifixion was Friday, the resurrection was on Sunday, but there's many people that are stuck in Saturday. And you have no more hope. You thought the marriage was gonna work out this way. You thought that the business deal would go this way. You thought the diagnosis would turn. You thought, and now, right now, you're stuck in Saturday. But the beauty is, Sunday's coming. Don't lose hope, cause Sunday's coming. When I, when I heard this song, should we just sing it? Friday's good, cause Sunday's coming. Don't lose hope. Devil, you're done, you better start. I like that quote right there. Friday's good, cause Sunday's coming. You might be stuck on Saturday, but Sunday is on the way. A miracle, miracle. How many, how many just grateful for the miracle in your life? Where you, where you lost all hope, right? Against all hope, something happened and shifted. You're like, oh my goodness, even through the worst pain, God can still get the glory. He can still work all this out for his glory. I don't understand it, but I believe it. It takes faith. In, in Hebrews 11, it says, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. I don't understand it, but I'm gonna trust God. He's gonna make a way for Sunday. And he does it time and time and time again. There's a quote in this song that says, that wasn't the end, that wasn't the end. Let me tell you what happened next. I feel like someone just needs to hear that statement right now. Maybe that's the only thing you came here for. That isn't the end. This isn't the end, folks. It's not gonna turn out like you had hoped or had you planned, but it's not the end. There's hope. That's exactly what happened on that Sunday morning. Matthew 28 now, verse one, early on Sunday morning as the new day was dawning. Mary Magdalene, the other Mary, went to visit the tomb. Suddenly there's a great earthquake for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven. This is so cool. When you're reading the Bible, like just like picture yourself watching this. He rolled aside the stone and just sat on it. His face shone like lightning, his clothing as white as snow. The guards, remember the guards that were put there? They shook with fear when they saw him. They fell into a dead faint. <laughs> then the angel spoke to the women. Don't be afraid. I know you're looking for Jesus who was crucified. He isn't here. I got good news. He is, come on, let someone say it. He is risen from the dead, just as he said would happen. <laughs> come and see where his body was lying. The ultimate hope, friends. The power of the resurrection. The greatest single day in human history that's why we gather. That's why this building is packed right now. Why? To celebrate the ultimate hope we have. If you're hopeless, go to the resurrection. Go to the power of God. This is where everything stems from. Your heartbreak, your pain. Look to the cross, but look to the resurrection. That's when everything changes. I was meditating on this, and I was thinking about how steady and secure this truth is. The one world religion whose leader is still alive. That's powerful. The Bible says that after some of these people saw him, over 500 witnesses saw him at the same time. This is a historical fact that should just bring a ton of faith and deep peace into your heart. That one day when I take my last breath on this planet, I'm gonna take my first in heaven. It's the ultimate hope. It's the hope of heaven. And that's what you need. And I'm not sure who you are in here today. 
But that's my prayer. I, I came on assignment as a hope dealer to just represent the king and say, he's already done it. Yeah, he was buried. He rose from the dead, proving who he is. Now, he simply gives you the invitation, no matter what you've done, resurrection power, salvation, new life can happen today. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. God, thank you for what a great word from your scriptures today. And I pray specifically for the hopeless and the hurting in this building and online. Would you touch their soul? Oxygen for the soul, we need hope. And those who have already come to Christ, we pray over them now. The circumstances and the situations and the brokenness in this world, would you just soothe their pain, give them hope again? Maybe it hadn't turned out like they planned, but you're gonna work all this together for your good. We trust you to do it. It's a deep peace in our soul today. Let us breathe again. Let us breathe again. The chaos in our minds, I pray that you would just sort out and make clear once again. Panic, anxiety would go in Jesus' name. Give us hope. Even in the waiting, even in the wondering, we want to place our trust and faith back in you again today. In Jesus' name. Before I say amen, I want to also give an opportunity.